we'll get started so in the previous class we were talking about the topic of state of a dynamic system and i was going through an example of a vehicle which is driving on the road and the inputs are pretty clear for the vehicle they are accelerator brake and steering and the eventual goal for the vehicle is to have a safe driving strategy which is to maintain some distance safe distance with respect to all the vehicles on the road or all the obstacles on the road and then we had proceeded to the discussion for identifying a set of variables that we believe are important for driving the vehicle and among them were speed of the vehicle distance to other vehicle relative speed and so on and so forth one of the questions that i had asked you in the previous class is uh, we could potentially throw in a couple of states like temperature in chicago or position of the moon uh, because that also updates um, in a certain fashion so the next state is going to be a function of the current state uh, but I'm sure all of you would be feeling some sort of discomfort with adding these two things, adding these two quantities as part of the description of the state of the vehicle. So can someone tell me what exactly is the problem with adding temperature of Chicago or, temp or position of the moon as part of the state of this vehicle? What's wrong with that? <clears throat> Um, the next state doesn't change if we change the temperature of Chicago or position of the moon. I mean, the, uh, the other state won't change. The yeah, other the state. other states will not change. Okay, so let's uh, let's write down. So the first argument is other states do not change. With uh, let me call this y t. So other states do not change with yt. So that's one argument. What's the other argument? The question, let me write the question. The question is why is yt not a state of the vehicle. So one answer someone said is other states, uh, which is let's say the position of the vehicle or this or speed of the vehicle is not really affected by changes in YT. Any other argument why YT should not be part of the state of the vehicle? Okay. Yeah, you have some thoughts? They don't affect the output. That's right, well, uh, what do you mean by output? Uh, so the output would be the safe driving distance with respect to other right. vehicles. So, yeah, so that's... Um, so these ones don't yeah. determine... Excellent output. output. That, that's exactly the right answer. So YT does not affect the objective. Okay. So we have certain states that do not affect the objective and therefore we will ignore those states from the description of the state space of the vehicle. Okay, so our objective here is to drive safely, maintain safe distance with respect to all the other vehicles on the road. And all of these quantities that we talked about, they affect the, the decision and they affect uh, the safe distance like if you want to maintain safe distance with other vehicles on the road you need to be cognizant of all these other quantities all these quantities but as far as temperature in chicago goes or the position of the moon goes they don't really affect the objective which is safe driving strategy um, for the vehicle on the other hand if the vehicle was say tracking the moon 
uh, for some reason, then certainly the position of moon is part of the state description of the vehicle. Okay, so um, uh, you know if you are if you have a electric vehicle, then the temperature of the environment is part of the state space of the vehicle because the battery output is affected by the temperature of the external environment. So the battery output will be quite different if you are in a minus, uh, you know, one degree Celsius, uh, degree Fahrenheit temperature versus if you are in 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperature zone. So the battery output gets affected by that. And so in electric vehicles, the temperature of the city that you're living in affects the uh, output of the vehicle. Okay. so. So that's uh, an excellent discussion on the state, what, what constitutes state of a system. So let me give you a formal definition of the state of a dynamic system. So you have some initial variable. So X zero is the initial variable and let's say u0 to ut is the action applied on the system. Variable of physical quantities Initial vector, initial vector So we say XT is the state if xt plus one equals to some function f of xt comma ut. Okay, so a quantity xt would be the state at time t if xt is a function of the initial state and all the actions you have taken so far. And the evolution of the state can be written as a function of the current state and the current action. Okay, so this says that your state xt is a function of what, what was the initial condition of the system and all the actions that you have taken so far. And more importantly, that the next state is going to be a function of the current state and the current action. So then you say xt is the state of the system. Okay, any question about the, the definition of the state of a dynamic system? Okay, and next definition I'm going to talk about is the payoff relevant state.
or you could equivalently say cost relevant state. So for the initial, for the first definition of state, you don't really need to have an objective function associated with the system. But when you talk about payoff relevant state or cost relevant state, then you have to have an objective that the system needs to satisfy. And pretty much all systems are satisfying some objective. So it's not difficult to uh, imagine, uh, you know, a system where there will be some objective for the system. Um, you know, if a vehicle is supposed to drive on the road, a truck is supposed to, um, you know, drive on the road and carry like tons of goods. Uh, so, so most of the systems have some certain objective. And so if they have objectives associated with it, then you can have a description of what is called payoff relevant state or cost relevant state, which can be defined as so let's say, uh, I won't, so the formal definition is very mathematical. So let me define it in the following way. Let's say you have a state, is the state xt plus one is a function of xt comma ut, yt plus one is a function of xt comma yt comma ut and then the cost function c of t is a function purely of xt and ut okay so you have like a huge state vector you have divided the state vector into two quantities, xt and, U, xt and yt. And the evolution equation for xt just depends on xt itself, whereas the evolution equation for yt may post possibly depend on xt. And the cost function depends only on xt, it doesn't depend on yt. Then xt is the payoff relevant state. Okay, because yt doesn't really affect the payoff at all. Okay, so in the case of the driving example we just talked about, the cost function there was to maintain safe distance. Well, if the distance is smaller than certain threshold, then there is a huge cost incurred. So that's the cost function we are talking about. And that the cost function there is not, does not depend on the temperature of Chicago or position of the moon. So therefore, um, the temperature of Chicago and position of the moon was a uh, payoff irrelevant. And only the speed and position of the vehicle and relative speed and relative position of other vehicles on the road were payoff relevant states. Okay. So I hope uh, it's clear from these two uh, statements, how you would argue whether something you are, a system that you are looking at uh, what would be the possible states of the system? So if you're looking at an air conditioning system for a room or a house, then the temperature is an appropriate state of the system. And uh, you know how much heat you are injecting or how much he heat you are rejecting from that system would be the control action, which will be taken by the air conditioning system. That's the action will be taken by the air conditioning system in that case. Okay, and you can come up with similar examples in, in your own context. You know, in, in material science, there will be some material properties of the system that would be the state of the system and the heat or pressure applied on that material would be the action, the, the, the action UT. And uh, in the case of inventory, so for instance, Kroger or, or Whole Foods or Walmart or Giant Eagle, their state is how many stuff they have in their inventory in a specific store. 
and their action would be how, how much of new items they need to buy for each of the specific items in their inventory. So for instance, how much spinach should I buy? How much milk should I buy? And, and so on. So that's, um, that would be the state and the action for a place like Kroger or Walmart. So, so that's why these kind of dynamic systems appear in a large number of uh, real world situations. And uh, what we are going to study today is dynamic optimization methods to optimize their cost function in order to achieve their objectives. Okay, so typically every objective that you have for that system needs to be translated into a specific cost function. And once you do the translation, it becomes very clear what would the payoff relevant state be. And then you need to run some of the dynamic optimization algorithms we'll be talking about in the next few days. So I'm gonna pause here for questions. Um, you know, you can, uh, I'm also gonna pause here to, um, to seek whether you have a system, a dynamic system in mind. So let's say if you, a non-traditional dynamic system in mind, maybe something you're looking at for your research and you can perhaps inform the class about what the relevant state of the system, uh, what's, what are the relevant states for that system and what is the control action for the system? Anyone has any examples, any non-traditional examples, non-obvious examples, which you want to share with the class? Okay, so no examples. Any questions so far on the state or payoff relevant state? Okay, let's, uh, let's proceed to a discussion about potential policies. So control policy. Okay, so we say, so there are two types of policies, control policies, open loop policies, and feedback policy. Okay, so in open loop policy, the action UT is independent of X1 to XT. Okay, whereas in the feedback policy, action UT is dependent on dependent on uh, x t okay so you use the current state to de determine what action you need to take at that time whereas in the open loop policy the action would be independent of the states x1 to xt but it could be dependent on x0 Okay, so you just look at the initial state and you start behaving in a certain fashion. You start executing a set of commands. That's called an open loop policy. Um, but if you are waiting for the state information to arrive and based on the state information, you take an action, that's called a feedback policy. So typically you de denote a feedback policy. I'm gonna denote it by gamma t which maps the state x t to the set of actions at u t, okay? This is known as a feedback policy.
Okay, so there are two types of policies, open loop policy and feedback policy. In the open loop policy, you don't, you don't look at the current state of the system, you just execute an action based on some predetermined rules. And in the feedback policy, you, <coughs> you look at the current state of the system and then you execute an action based on the current state of the system. So you can think of open loop, open loop policy as uh, driving a car with your eyes closed, whereas feedback policy as driving a car with your eyes open. Okay, because when your eyes are open, you're looking at the current state of the system and then you are taking an action. Whereas if your eyes are closed, you're essentially just executing a set of commands without necessarily observing the state of the system. So can someone tell me a physical situation where open loop policy is used versus, a I mean, I think feedback policy is pretty clear. Almost every situation that you encounter in day-to-day -day life with your eyes open, you are essentially making a feedback policy, using a feedback policy because you look at what the current state of the situation is and then you take an action. So can someone tell me if you know of a situation where open loop policy is used, where you don't really observe the state of the system, you just execute a command based on some predetermined rule? Any examples you can think of for open loop policy? <clears throat> um, maybe mixing, let's say different uh, liquids and you know uh, a priori what, uh, let's say, like valve opening that needs to send right. out a particular right. fluid flow. Yeah, yeah. So mixing could be potentially open loop policy depend. So assuming you just pour in certain amount of stuff and uh, mix them, then that could be, yes, that could be an open loop policy. But if you're carefully checking the measurement, then that's not, that's not a open loop policy. Yeah. Great example. Okay, I'll give you another example, which is uh, in, insulin pumps. So many insulin pumps, they just deliver a certain amount of insulin into the bloodstream or, or into the tissue uh, underneath your skin um, at every time interval. So at, at 12 noon, it will inject, let's say 5 ml of insulin at, at 4 p.m. it will inject 2 ml of insulin at 10 p.m. it will inject 5 ml of insulin and so on. Okay, so that's a open loop policy because it doesn't measure the blood glucose level that you have currently in your bloodstream and then comes up with a carefully designed uh, quantity of insulin that needs to be injected in your body. So for instance, you could have a situation where the blood glucose level is, uh, let's say 150 units and you need to inject 4.35 ml of insulin into the bloodstream based on this measurement. So that would be a feedback policy, but uh, my understanding is, and I don't use insulin pumps, but I know secondhand from other people who use insulin pumps that it just delivers a certain amount of insulin uh, without necessarily measuring the blood glucose level. So that's one situation where people typically use open loop policy rather than a closed loop policy. Nobody measures the insulin, the blood glucose level before injecting insulin into the system, into the body. So the system is a body in that situation. Many so is that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is the open loop policy um, most commonly used instead of a feedback policy just for simplicity? Because it seems like in the case of mixing fluids or in the case of insulin pumps, uh, if you could have a feedback policy, it would be better. That's right. But maybe it's just not worth the complexity. That's so exactly right. Settle that's, for an open yeah. loop. Yeah, you okay. got it right. Yeah, exactly. 
So open loop, so it's not, so I'm not going to say that open loop policies are used everywhere. So there are systems where the potential for disaster in the case of open loop policy is significant, like driving a car with your eyes closed and therefore feedback policy is used there. But for very small scale or embedded systems type situations, you typically go for open loop policy because you just need to have a map and uh, based on that map, you will take some action instead of trying to come up with a very sophisticated algorithm, which would determine what the actual action should be. Um, yeah, that's so, so basically feedback policy is far more complicated. So the system has to be able to hand, handle that kind of complication. Any other question? So I, I also want to write uh, car engines. So many car engines uh, run, compute optimal open loop policies every now and then, and then they execute the optimal open loop policy. Um, uh, so, so that's how they sort of minimize the uh, so so emissions of the vehicle or minimize the noise coming out of vehicle engine. Uh, improve the driving uh, quality. Uh, what is it called? Driving quality? No, the response of the vehicle based on driver input. So you know, so if even if you press the accelerator very hard, the vehicle is going to accelerate slowly rather than having a very jerky motion because of your bad driving strategy. So, so, so there are a lot of uh, different algorithms running in the car. Many of them are open loop policies that are being updated every few seconds or every few milliseconds to improve the overall efficiency of the vehicle. Okay, and but depending on the complexity of the situation, feedback policies are increasingly used in vehicles to improve the efficiency. So, um, so that's still some ongoing research happening, going from open loop policies to feedback policies. Okay, feedback policy would be used in large generators. I'm sure many of you have taken EC 3551 slash 5551, which is feedback control systems or, or uh, the state space control systems. So in all those courses, you just learn about feedback policies. You don't really learn about open loop policy. So in this class, we'll talk more about the difference between open loop policy and feedback policy. Okay. Now let's formulate an optimization problem. Um, so I want to minimize the running cost plus the terminal cost t equals zero to t minus one and this would be my J. I'm not going to tell you what with, with respect to what we are minimizing and what what am I going to write as what would the what would J be a function of? So we'll talk about it in a bit, but uh, I'm just going to introduce some terminologies in order to have a better discussion later. So this is called running cost. This is called terminal cost. Okay, and this would be called the performance index. Performance index or objective or cost function. So it has different meanings or you can see the literature and they'll have different names across different papers. Okay, so you have a running cost. So at every point of time, you incur a running cost and then based on the terminal state, you incur a terminal cost for the system. So if you want to go from Earth to Mars, then the terminal cost will be, I want the distance between the rover 
and the planet Mars or some point on the planet Mars to be equal to zero. So the terminal cost would penalize the distance between the point where you wanted to land on Mars and the current position of the vehicle where you actually landed. Okay, so that's what is captured by the terminal cost. If you have a terminal objective where you want to be, where you want the state of the system to be, then that is captured by the terminal cost. Whereas the running cost it depends on the current state and the current action. So how far you are, let's say from Mars and how much fuel you want to inject um, into the engine, the rocket engine, so that you are making steady progress towards getting where you want to get to. So that's captured by the running cost. And then you have a performance index. Now you can do the minimization over open loop policies or you can do the minimization over closed loop policy. Okay. And if you're doing the minimization of the performance index over open loop policy, the key tool that we are going to talk about is maximum principle. And if you want to minimize the performance index with respect to the closed loop policy, then the key tool we are going to study is dynamic programming. Okay, have any of you heard of these two terms, maximum principle and dynamic programming before? Yeah. What, yes, what have you heard about? Uh, with dynamic programming, it's usually, um, especially for dynamic systems, it's usually the best. Um, it's a holy grail for comparison against uh, for a comparison of optimization algorithms because it gives right. you the, you know, it captures the running cost of the terminal cost. Right, right, right. But that's also captured by the maximum principle. Uh, so depending on which application you're looking at, you know, you may be using dynamic programming versus maximum principle. So anyone has heard of maximum principle before and in what context? Nobody has heard of maximum principle before or Pontryagin maximum principle or Pontryagin minimum principle or, or something along those lines. MPC, has anyone heard of MPC model predictive control? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Cool, so we are going to talk about all of those topics um, in, in the subsequent lectures. So in the case of in the case of optimal open loop policy, I'm going to write the performance index J as a function of U zero to U capital T minus one. Okay, whereas in the case of closed loop policy, I'm going to write J as a function of gamma zero to gamma T minus one. Okay, so in the case of closed loop policy, the performance index is a function of the feedback policies. Whereas in the case of open loop policy, the performance index is a function of the actual action. Okay. Uh, a little bit of history. So the maximum principle was, uh, I, I'm not sure whether it should be called invented or discovered, but it was discovered, let, let me call it this, well, no, I don't know. I don't know if mathemat mathematical theorems are discovered or invented. Anyone knows whether they are invented or discovered? Mm -hmm. What would be the right? Okay, let's, let's just call it invented. So maximum principle was invented around 1948 by a Russian mathematician called 
Pontry again. And the dynamic programming was conceived around 1949 slash 1950 by Isaacs slash Bellman. So they independently dis discovered the idea of dynamic programming in 1949, 1950. Okay, so that's why people generally refer to it, it as Bellman's principle of dynamic programming or Isaac Bellman principle of dynamic programming. So those are used uh, pretty often in the literature. And with maximum principle, people would typically call it Pontryagin maximum principle or Pontryagin minimum principle, depending on whether they are minimizing a cost or maximizing the reward. Okay, so they are pretty established theory now, about 50, 70 years old theory at this point of time, and they are increasingly seeing a lot of usage in a wide variety of dynamic systems. Okay. Any questions so far on the notion of performance index? Okay. Let's talk about optimal open loop policy. So the goal is I want to minimize J of U zero to U T minus one. I want to minimize over U zero to U T minus one. I know X zero, X zero is given. The initial state of the system is given. But I have constraints, right? So I have constraints, which is x1 equals to f0, x0, u0, x2 equals to f1, x1, u1, xt equals to ft minus one, xt minus one, ut minus one. Okay, so I have the usual state constraints um, that, that appear in the system and I need to make sure that these constraints are satisfied. This is the system equation or rather state equation. <clears throat> so in the simplest setting, even if I'm solving a dynamic optimization problem, there is, it can be posed as a constrained optimization problem. Okay. So how would you, so if I pose this problem to you, how would you go ahead and solve this problem? So I give you a minimization problem of a dynamic system. I give you the initial state and I ask you to find the minimum of this performance index how would you go ahead and solve this problem? Now that you know all about static optimization, can someone throw a light on how to solve this dynamic optimization problem? How would you solve it? Uh, do a static optimization at each point, each time step. Do a static optimization at each time step. Uh, let me think about it. Well, okay, so. Which will be a sequence, like you do at one time step move and then. I see. 
So the problem with that is either you have to start at the beginning or you have to start at the end, right? Because if you're doing stage wise, then either you start from the beginning and do it one stage at a time, or you start in the end and do one stage at a time, right? And in both situations, the problem is that you don't know what is a desired future state or desired past state is supposed to be because everything is given in terms of a cost function. So it's not clear what, what my desired state would be at a future time. So how about, how about you do it all at once? Okay, so instead of doing it in a stage-wise fashion, you just try to solve everything at once. How would you go ahead? How would you do it? Like what would be your main tool be if you want to solve the entire problem at once? Did you find the Lagrangian? Right, right. So you can use any of the Lagrange multiplier method. Uh, post this as a constrained optimization problem. So this is a constrained optimization problem. And you can pose it as, as a minimum over u0 to ut minus 1 and x1 to xt. So those will also become the... Uh, a variable over which you are optimizing and you use any of the Lagrange multiplier method to solve this problem. Okay, so you have the stage-wise problem. You pose this as a giant optimization problem with lots of variables and then you try and solve this giant optimization problem using your favorite constrained optimization method. Do you have control over X1 and XT? Aren't those uh, values that come out of the functions like F0, F0, right. F1? Right, right. But when you're posing this as a giant optimization problem, they also become variable uh, of the optimization problem. It's just that they don't, there is an equality constraint. So all those variables can get eliminated because of the equality constraint. So let's, let's think about it. So if you have minimum of C of X, uh, let me, so remember assignment one, problem four, you had C of X1 comma X2 such that X1 plus X2 was equal to 1000. You remember that, that, that example, mm -hmm. right? And you could post this problem equivalently as minimize X1, C of X1, 1000 minus X1, right? So you have an equality constraint, you can, uh, then you can uh, get rid of one of the variables over oh, okay. optimizing. So the same thing is happening here as well. So even though I write it as an optimization variable because of these equality constraints, they will all get eliminated. Okay. Yeah. So we're doing like the opposite of right. what we did. Right. right. Okay. Okay. So now it's a constrained optimization problem, just like we, I mentioned earlier, uh, we need to, we have like a bunch of equality constraints. And as we have seen, when you have equality constraint, you can get rid of variables. Uh, and then uh, with a fewer number of variables, you can solve this optimization problem. So that's what we will do. And that's the approach of Pontiagin maximum principle. So here is how to do it. Let me, let me write xt as a function of x0, u0, u1, u t minus 1. Okay. So then I can write this C of xt comma ut as C of pt 
x0 u0 u1 to ut minus 1 ut sorry ct Okay, so I can write the state at time t as a function of the initial state and all the actions you have taken so far of, uh, in, in, until time t. And then you can substitute that expression for xt in the cost function uh, of the problem. Okay. So what is the formula for phi t? Now that's very easy to see. So x1 equals to f0, x0, u0. x2 equals to f1, f0, x0, Sorry, this should be phi two. This should be phi three. And so on. Okay, so is this conversion clear? So the first thing we do is write the state as a function of initial state and all the actions so far. And then I can substitute that in the cost function. Uh, so CT and C capital T, I can substitute that to get the cost function as a function of initial state and all the actions you have taken so far. And the terminal cost will be the initial state, a function of the initial state and all the actions you have taken until the end of the horizon. Actually, this should be ut minus one because the entire decision process stops at time t, capital T. Okay, so after eliminating all these variables uh, concerning xt, I can rewrite the optimization problem equivalently as I want to minimize j of u0 to ut minus 1 is equal to summation of ct phi t this whole thing ut plus ct p capital t this minimization is only for the variables u0 to ut minus 1 so i've eliminated all the states through this approach.
okay so is this process clear let me go over it once again we started with a giant constrained optimization problem which had all the cost functions all the state transition function the state equation and the minimization was over a bunch of variables that includes all the actions so far taken during the entire process and all the states visited during the entire process then we kind of realized that look we have so many equality constraints perhaps there is an easy way to um, to just absorb these equality constraints in the objective function itself uh, to not have to have a completely unconstrained optimization so we'll not have any constraints we can eliminate all the constraints because they are all equality constraints so we started doing that the way to do that is you substitute you get x1 as a function of x0 and u0 you get x2 as a function of x0 u0 and u1 you get x3 as a function of x0 u0 u1 and u2 and so on and then you substituted these functions in the cost function itself okay and so far we have not changed anything about the overall optimization problem all we have done is just substituted appropriate variables in the cost functions once we do that the optimization problem equivalently becomes i want to minimize the summation of the running cost uh, composition with phi t and the terminal cost composition with phi terminal like capital t okay and we have through this approach we have eliminated all the states okay now it's just a giant unconstrained optimization because i want to minimize an objective function subject to uh, there are no constraints here on the actions okay so like we always do whenever we come up with a new optimization problem we first determine the first order and second order necessary conditions for optimality so what's the first order necessary condition for optimality here now that you know that this is a giant unconstrained optimization problem what's the first order necessary condition the first order derivative uh, has to equal 0 that's right so at the optimal point you want the first derivative of j with respect to every ut should be equal to 0 okay and this should hold for all time t from 0 to t minus 1 okay so that's the first order necessary condition of course the second order necessary condition can also be defined in the same way but this time you don't want just the first derivative you want the second derivative so you have to you have to take the second derivative of j with respect to all the actions not just ut okay now this j has a very specific structure okay it's not just any general function this particular function j comprises of summation of functions and even within each summation there are other functions which is captured by this state transition equation okay so these functions are appear in this phi t so potentially i could do a little bit more math and i could exactly calculate what this expression is equal to okay so the question is or not the question but the plan is use the structure of cost function to to derive an expression for gradient of ut of j okay and this is what we will do in the next class um and once you compute the gradient of j with respect to ut you can then run the gradient descent algorithm to compute the optimal action and that algorithm is known as the back propagation algorithm
So we will study this backpropagation algorithm in the next class. It's actually the derivation of the black, black backpropagation algorithm, all of which is intricately related to the maximum principle, uh, Pontryagin's maximum principle. Uh, and in fact, most of the neural networks uh, are trained using backpropagation algorithms. So you can imagine how, uh, how much effect this algorithm has had on the uh, contemporary machine learning world. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about all these things in the next class. If there are any questions, uh, I'll stick around uh, now to answer them, or we can meet during office hours if you have questions about assignment. Or if you have a quick question as about assignment, you can ask me now as well. No questions? All right, so I'll see you some of you guys in the office hours, which I'll start in about 10, 15 minutes.